Thank you so much. Um, Yes, this is I mean, perhaps the first talk I've ever given without visuals, and so uh, bear with me. It's going to be a new thing for me. Um, and I just wanted to also uh, thank everyone um, who was involved in, in putting this conference together, Greg and Dominic. Um, I was immediately um, fascinated by the call for papers, uh, in part because I was really pleased that there would be so many people from um, plant sciences, um, agronomy, and law here. Um, so I said to somebody this morning that I was really excited about the conference because I wanted to learn some things, um, and I already have, and I'm excited to learn more um, this afternoon. Uh, the title of my paper is A Commons in the Patent Office, the U.S. Patent Office's Agricultural Department from 1836 to 1861. So um, I've also been amused that so far all of the presenters have thought that we're outliers. I am yet another outlier, I, I think, um, in that I'll be talking principally about the 19th century and the United States. And while I'm talking about plants that are quite literally in the Patent Office, uh, the plants in question were not subject to property rights, uh, but rather freely distributed to all interested parties. Um, and the paper is inspired by several contentions. The first is, is just the basic one that we can learn about contemporary property regimes uh, by examining those from which they emerged. Um, very historical claim. Um, the second is that we should acknowledge the role of cultures, cultures of bureaucracy in shaping property regimes, um, rather than focusing narrowly, for example, on uh, legal doctrine and case law. Uh, hence my focus on the patent office. Uh, the third contention um, is that if we want to understand property claims to plants, it's, a, it's very useful to examine moments at which plants were not subject to logics of property, uh, but rather understood as objects of common use. Uh, and it's the last of these that's going to be my focus today. I think it's a, a generally under-acknowledged fact that historically patent offices have done much more than simply issue patents. I want to talk today about the agricultural research sponsored by the 19th century U.S. Patent Office, and particularly its efforts to amass and circulate the world's seeds for the benefit of American farmers. This publicly funded research was situated within an organization that nominally existed to distribute limited monopolies for inventions. The effect was a bifurcated political economy of innovation, carving out a zone for common use within a regime that was largely dedicated to buttressing private property rights. This model of public research and free circulation of specimens persisted in the U.S. Department of Agriculture and also in the seed banks of international agricultural research organizations, which are the subject of some of my new research. My question today is why this arrangement existed and how it relates to an ostensibly opposed system of property claims to plants. So first I'm going to tell you a few things about the program itself, uh, then I'll talk about its ideological underpinnings and contradictions, as well as some of the debates these engendered. And finally, I'll analyze what these debates over the proper political economy of innovation have to tell us about contemporary quandaries with regard to ownership of agricultural knowledge. So as the historian Philip Pauly observed, um, at first blush it may seem ironic that an organization created to issue limited monopolies for inventions would collect and distribute self-replicating natural objects free of charge. But in fact, these efforts fell squarely within the Patent Office's mandate to promote science and useful arts. The relevant clause of the Constitution, the so-called intellectual property clause, uh, grants Congress the power to issue patents and copyrights expressly for this purpose to promote science and useful arts. Beginning with the first superintendent of patents, William Thornton, in 1802, the leadership of the Patent Office interpreted this clause broadly and exercised considerable discretion to define their occupations as they pleased. Thornton, for example, envisioned the Patent Office as the site of a great museum of models and scientific instruments. This was in part to satisfy the disclosure requirement of patent applications. Patents were granted in exchange for making the operations of an invention open to the public. But it was also more than that. Thornton imagined the Patent Office as a site of enlightenment and public education. The Patent Office's agricultural program was in large part due to the ambitions of Henry Ellsworth, who was named superintendent of patents in 1835. He was elevated to the status of commissioner a year later when the institution of the new Patent Act put him at the helm of the scientific corps charged with examining all patent applications. Uh, prior to 1835, uh, 1836, the U.S. patent system worked by simple registration rather than examination. Beginning with Ellsworth's tenure, the Patent Office oversaw an ambitious effort to import seeds and cuttings for the benefit of American farmers, including grains, forage and fiber plants, mulberries, tea, legumes, garden vegetables, and temperate and tropical fruits. 
It dedicated funds to importation, propagation, and free distribution of new seed varieties, as well as the production and circulation of statistics and agricultural research. In 1862, the Agricultural Division was folded into the newly established U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, at first, Ellsworth ran the seed program entirely off the books, um, and then in 1839, he secured the first appropriation from Congress for the work, uh, $1,000, uh, in part by claiming he required staff and funds to manage the unwieldy collections of the U.S. exploring expedition to the Pacific, uh, which was currently sending a lot of ornithological specimens back to the Patent Office. The Patent Office became a holding pen for these collections, in part because it was the largest building in Washington, but also because its mandate to promote science and useful arts made it a plausible candidate for the care and display of scientific collections. And in that sense, into the middle of the 19th century, the Patent Office continued to function as a scientific society with a public cabinet, much like the one that William Thornton had envisioned. Meanwhile, Ellsworth interpreted the, ag interpreted the agency's mandate to promote science and the useful arts to include the encouragement of agricultural improvement beyond the bounds of the patent system. Unlike the numerous machines employed to cultivate them, seeds were not patentable, nor would patents have been easily enforced for naturally reproducing objects requiring little capital for production. Ellsworth's redirection of funds to agricultural improvement uh, had intellectual, personal, and political rationales. He was a noted agriculturalist with an, interest, with an interest in farm statistics. In making improvement his special cause, he represented his own interests, not only as an agriculturalist, but also as an investor in Western lands in the United States. Ideologically, these initiatives allowed Jacksonian Democrats, such as Ellsworth, to mitigate their aversion to monopolies, uh, which patents were, uh, by providing comparable privileges to farmers who lacked access to patents. This is also Philip Pauli's argument, by the way. Um, and as Pauli also noted, uh, Ellsworth imagined the patent office as a meeting place for a national community of seed sharers. Uh, he claimed that agricultural inventors themselves had inspired the program by bringing local seed varieties of garden vegetables and maize with them to the patent office uh, when they visited on other affairs. Such practices derived in part from traditions of seed sharing as mutual aid and cooperative undertaking. By encouraging their donations and providing infrastructure for exchange, Ellsworth carved out a space for common use within a temple to private property. But this framing around mutual aid and cooperation obscures the extent to which European maritime commerce and the networks of naturalists it supported also provided models for government seed collection in the 19th century. When Americans pursued agricultural improvement, it was with reference to imperial models. Early Republicans, such as Thomas Jefferson, imagined the United States as an agrarian nation with cosmopolitan and global orientation, including agricultural and scientific societies populated by property at elites with ties to European botanic gardens. When Ellsworth expanded federal efforts to import seeds, it was with reference to Jefferson's vision. The Patent Office amassed and distributed thousands of new varieties to interested agriculturalists through the machinery of the U.S. Navy and Consular Service, missionaries and American citizens abroad, Modeling its efforts on European imperial exploration and natural science, the Patent Office adapted, vari adopted variable practices of collection based on commerce, gift, exchange, and smuggling. This enterprise spanned Atlantic and Pacific worlds and involved a heady degree of speculation in the ecological and economic prospects of new crops. From the 1850s, an international marketplace of seeds and plants centered in Western Europe took shape. The growth of this industry was facilitated by technologies uh, of steamship navigation, uh, shipping in glass vented Wardian cases, uh, and elaborate printed catalogs of seeds. Moreover, it was supported by French and British colonial ventures. Uh, the U.S. models its seed importation efforts on these enterprises and relied on many of the same networks. So just to, to provide one example, uh, when Commodore Matthew Perry of the U.S. Navy sailed his gunboats into Edo Harbor um, in 1852 with the intention of opening Japan to U.S. trade, um, his crew included a botanist, James Morrow, uh, as well as naturalist and missionary Samuel Wells Williams, um, who had busied himself for some years collecting seeds uh, and cuttings um, from China and shipping them to the Patent Office in Washington, D.C., in route to Japan, Morrow gathered numerous plants from South Africa, Java, and China. Via James Dobbin, then the Secretary of Navy, he forwarded vegetables, barley, rice, beans, cotton, persimmon, tangerines, and African wheat to the Patent Office. With the aid of the U.S. Consul in Singapore, Morrow also forwarded cotton and sugar cane um, he had collected from local sugar estates in both Mauritius and Singapore. 
As this example suggests, the Patent Office's agricultural programs were more significant for their generally expansionist orientation than for any anti-monopoly sentiment such as Ellsworth may have harbored. Although the seed distribution program flagged after Ellsworth's tenure ended in 1845, the basic infrastructure he established remained in place. All commissioners after Ellsworth maintained a commitment to the agricultural programs of the Patent Office. And at least outwardly, commissioners claimed to serve the interests of both eastern farmers who were battling depleted soil and western ones who were in custody of newly tilled land. But their expansive address concealed tensions between advocates of free labor and slavery. As lands annexed during the Mexican-American War dramatically increased the southwestern frontier, national debate coalesced around the question of whether new territories would permit slavery, and these conflicts erupted in the halls of the Patent Office. In spite of the overt controversy, the activities of the Agricultural Department didn't clearly express one partisan agenda or economic interest, but rather reflected a broad political commitment to national expansion. In fact, the seed distribution program developed in tandem with military actions to annex Western lands. Uh, Ellsworth inaugurated the program on the heels of the Indian Removal Act in 1835. Uh, Commissioner Charles Mason revived it in the wake of the Mexican-American War in 1848. The Patent Office's effort to import and distribute seeds and cuttings for the benefit of American farmers was part of a concerted exercise of military force to secure the American West for Euro-American agricultural settlement. Okay, so what did it mean in this case to share seeds? Uh, That's a historical question. I also think it's a pertinent question in in contemporary terms. What does it mean to share seeds? Uh, It may have meant many things, and it may mean many things. The Patent Office's programs drew simultaneously on ideas of agrarian mutuality, cooperative association, and networks of global natural science rooted in European maritime exploration. These multiple traditions of seed sharing carried different assumptions about the status and significance of the materials in which they trafficked. The norms and etiquette of naturalists' exchange networks rendered seeds the property of the recipient who could preserve, exchange, or liquidate collections according to his or her own judgment. Models of seed sharing as mutual aid, in contrast, cast seeds as common property, implying an ethical burden to a wider community of farmers. Yet, uh, these ideologies ideologies of mutuality obscured the original appropriations of material through military and civilian networks derived from European imperial activity. The construction of nature as a common resource allowed European and American explorers to carve out zones of shared resources that were not subject to rules of trade, market, or variable customs of patronage and reciprocity. As printed text and plantation labor systems rationalized the skilled labor required for cultivation, plants were cast as products of nature rather than as artifacts of accumulated knowledge and technological practice. So legally, the construction of seeds as products of nature denied human labor in selecting and stewarding seeds across time, rendering them inadmissible for patents, but also implicitly sanctioning collection without regard to rights of ownership. Um, Interestingly, in all of these models, um, exchange networks of naturalists, mutual aid, uh, products of nature doctrine, it's precisely the non-commodification of seeds uh, that raised questions of access and custody rendering them subject to shifting claims of entitlement, rendering seeds subject to shifting claims of entitlement. Cast as objects of common use, not subject to the logics of property rooted in individual innovation, seeds nevertheless remained remained subject to complex bundles of entitlements. Rather than simple foils for individual rights of property, notions of commons, collectivity, and mutuality were complex in their own right, right, based on often contradictory principles of possession and access. These allowed sharing for some, but not others, and effaced the appropriation of global resources and knowledge to support national development. For even as economies of sharing were divisive, they were fundamentally patriotic, uh, demarcating a zone of global nature that could be tapped for national development. Okay, so by way of conclusion, um, persistent efforts to introduce new plant genetic material were one aspect of the rise of the U.S. as a global agricultural power, and the new varieties of cotton, sugar, and maize introduced in North America benefited farmers of these staples. New varieties facilitated the consolidation of regional agricultural economies of feed, grain, livestock, and wheat in the West, vegetable production in the Northeast, uh, and cotton and sugarcane in the South. The Patent Office's efforts to introduce new crops, in contrast, largely failed. 
Uh, most seeds didn't germinate, most farmers didn't get them. Um, yet the material transfers of seeds and plants were perhaps, perhaps less important than the precedent they established for agricultural development based on federally subsidized research, exploration, and transplantation. The establishment of these practices made for a seamless transition to a more robust and well-funded U.S. Department of Agriculture, setting American agricultural science, at least for a time, on the path of public research. Uh, the Patent Office's seed program was controversial. While advocates supported the federal government's strong role in introducing new crop varieties, critics believed it in interfered with individual improvers. Uh, they regarded seeds as market commodities subject to the rules of free commerce, not as objects of common use to be freely distributed. Um, opposition was especially well developed in the horticultural trades of, of the Northeast. Yet the narrow construction of these debates, according to the interests of American farmers, slaveholders or not, uh, horticulturalists and seed companies, ultimately obscured more fundamental and long-standing inequities in the collection and distribution of global resources, including continued appropriation and exploitation of indigenous American plants and reliance on European colonial expropriations in Asia, Africa, and the Americas. In other words, while the politics of distribution played out fiercely in the United States, the politics of collection remained obscure. Why is this important now? I think although many have identified patents as a primary mechanism of industrial control and plant breeding, as significant were the zones of improvement rendered invisible in acts of collection. For in spite of the language of naturalists, seeds had never been products of nature. They were always artifacts of human labor, however temporarily removed from 19th century Americans trying to make a good crop. Appri applying proprietary claims, uh, whether as objects or of public or private research, um, required that seeds be stripped of competing claims. When seeds became institutionalized uh, objects of improvement, or rather, pardon me, when seeds became objects of institutionalized improvement, available information regarding provenance and stewardship rarely did justice the history of the seed, which was often reduced instead to a point of geographic origin or a vague reference to native cultivators. These elisions laid the foundation for legal and scientific narratives of innovation, which elevated the claims of researchers and producers over the wide field of agrarian knowledge on which they drew. So here I think I'm trying to understand some of the problems that Ricardo was getting at in his paper, by the way, um, uh, but in reference to this, this quite narrow case. Uh, the basic research that was initi initiated by the Patent Office became the provenance of the new U.S. Department of Agriculture, land-grant colleges, and agricultural experiment stations, while applied research became controlled by a burgeoning seed industry intent on expanding markets for their wares. Uh, while sometimes at loggerheads, ultimately plant breeders benefited from public research. The government acquired plants and distributed them to farmers who worked to make them profitable. It also continued to sponsor extensive research and development of improved varieties. As Jack Kloppenberg has argued, uh, the development of hybrid maize in the United States in the uh, 20s and 30s was the outgrowth of decades of publicly funded experimentation. These efforts to breed proprietary hybrids accelerated the commodification of seeds in a private marketplace. But I think commodification was not so much a temporary, temporary imbalance of private and public interest as it was the logical outcome of federally supported enterprise regarding seeds as instruments of growth. Acquiring and cultivating useful plants remained a priority of federal research, but in casting improved varieties as objects of innovation, researchers refigured collected material as unimproved or natural, the raw material for subsequent development, construed as the common property of all humanity. So the focus of this paper has been moments at which plants were not subject to logics of property, but rather understood as objects of common use. Uh, this particular moment of contingency and contradiction between property regimes is a useful object of study because it helps us understand the ways in which intellectual property laws, including patents, trademarks, and copyrights, as well as, I think, the more novel variants of geographic indications, traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge, exist among many political economic strategies for promoting innovation and production of knowledge more generally. Uh, but I want to make the point that there's nothing innocent about the idea of a commons. Rather than a simple foil for intellectual or for individual rights of property, notions of collectivity and mutuality are complex in their own right. Um, they are often based on contradictory principles of possession and access, which allows sharing for some but not others, and often efface the appropriation of global resources and knowledge uh, put to the service of national development. 
However highly politicized the debate over the patent office's seed distribution programs, there was a basic consensus about whom the debate included. Had both pro-slavery and free labor apologists acknowledged the extent to which continental expansion followed European colonial models, they would have questioned their professed inclinations to liberty and novelty. By removing resources from their points of origin, plant explorers strip them of their human histories, rendering non-Western and indigenous progenitors invisible as sources of technical knowledge. So to contemporary sensibilities, uh, it's actually quite ironic that an attempt to construct a zone of common use within a private property regime, in fact, generated deeper and more structural exclusions and inequities um, as Asia and the Global South provided germplasm for Europe and North America. The imagination of a single world constructed of biologically diverse resources was less a preconduction, sorry, was less a precondition than a product of these efforts, enabling fictions of the global that are persistently deployed in contemporary contexts. So uh, I think the takeaway here is that if we want to understand the work that property claims do, we also have to attend to the types of knowledge and material that are excluded from their purview. I have more to say about this. I'm not going to say it now. Uh, I'll just end by saying that I think what's called for here is um, a revised history of agrarian knowledge uh, that takes into consideration not simply claims to ownership, but other values um, applied to labor, including you know stewardship and collectivity, um, and perhaps acknowledges labor and technology is multi-generational and existing over long time frames. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.